Welcome to the Acton Institute Events Podcast, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, Executive Producer. In this Acton Lecture Series program from December 3rd, 2020, founder of the Grand Rapids Center for Community Transformation, Justin Bean, addressed the topic of transformational leadership in a time of crises. Today's new normal demands authentic leaders who are grounded and yet reflective. But many of us go through life without a rhythm of both reflecting and discerning. Bean discusses how leaders can grow and contribute to the flourishing of our families, organizations, and culture during a time of crises. To learn more about upcoming and previous Acton Institute events, please visit our website at acton.org slash events. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Institute Events is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Welcome, everyone, to the December Acton Lecture Series. My name is Dan Churchwell, and I serve as the Director of Program Outreach at the Institute. It's my pleasure to introduce today for our December Acton Lecture Series, Dr. Justin Bean. Justin lives with his wife and three children in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He holds a Bachelor of Social Work from Western Michigan University, a Master's in Social Work and Management of Human Services from the University of Michigan, and a Master's in Ministry Leadership from Grand Rapids Theological Seminary. He earned his doctorate in transformational leadership with a focus on entrepreneurial transformation. Justin is the visionary founder of an innovative partnership here in Grand Rapids called the Grand Rapids Center for Community Transformation, a collective between nonprofits and social enterprises in the Grand Rapids area, helping to create the flourishing city that is the ideal for what we're looking for with the ideas of the Acton Institute. Today, for our December Acton Lecture Series, he will be discussing transformational leadership in a time of crisis. Well, welcome to transformational leadership in a time of crisis here at Acton. And uh, so excited to be able to have this time together. And thank you all for joining in to uh, this important conversation. And hopefully um, you're excited to kind of learn and listen, but then also really engage in some real back and forth and some dialogue. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, this past year uh, has been a crisis, has been traumatizing, has been uh, a whole lot of things for a number of reasons. And uh, I thought, you know, in thinking about what to what to share, uh, this really became a good opportunity to really talk about this. What does it mean to lead uh, with your family and your organization and your business and your church, uh, whatever it is that you have some leadership, authority, influence in and over, or as some would say, the weight that you lead, uh, those things that you influence. Um, how are you leading those things? How are you taking stewardship responsibility over those things in a time of crisis? Because in a time of crisis, we lose perspective. And so those were two kind of questions for thought to really begin to frame our conversation is what is what dream for your community, your family or organization? Again, the thing that you have in your control or authority over. Uh, what dream do you have that is emerging for you during this time? And be thinking about that because I think that's a critical piece uh, to what we're going to talk about. I think number two is like back to perspective is what new lens has been transforming your perspective? And maybe you don't have a lens that's been transforming your perspective. And that's why you're here engaging with us today, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to give you a few pieces of information that allow you to begin to have a new lens for this time. For this time, as I would say, is transformative, if you let it. We're always being formed. The question probably is, what are you being formed into? Is the challenges and the changes and the rapid uh, disruptions happening, are they forming you into becoming more human, more like the person of Jesus, 
more of a leader who embraces those challenges and the skills that you have to engage those? Or are you running away? Are you hiding? Are you being frustrated? And are you losing your perspective to be intentional and on purpose? So the reality of our world today is that it's changing fast. It's been changing fast. And a lot of the past year has really highlighted many of those changes. One of the mega trends that I've been tracking for a number of years is uh, the fact that we are living in a new urban reality. A new urban reality says that today we're living with a population, 54% of the world's population is living in a city or in a metropolitan area. You can see on the PowerPoint in 1910, only less than 5% of the world's population lived in cities. And it's trending that almost 70% of the world's population will live in cities in the next 20 years. That's 100% of the world's population growth will be absorbed by cities. And so cities are, what I like to say, both a magnet and that they're attracting people to it, to come for services, for opportunities, but it's also a magnifier. It's magnifying the challenges that maybe we've already had in cities. It's magnifying the injustices, it's magnifying the differences between religion and politics. And this is not just happening in our city here in Grand Rapids, which is clear, but also in cities across the US and across the globe. Another one of those things that are ma massively changing in addition to the demographic shift, which I would say which is include the reality of uh, same-sex marriage, the reality of um, mixed race uh, marriages. Uh, in fact, uh, currently uh, millennials now outnumber baby boomers, 71 million millennials. Um, we also have a mega trend that's affecting our, our world is technology and AI advancements. Some are saying that in the next 10 years, automation and technology, artificial intelligence will displace 30% of the world's population. We're it, wondering what are we gonna do about the increasing level of pandemics and natural resources and sustainability. In fact, two years ago, I was in Cape Town and um, after a few days in Johannesburg, a few days in Pretoria, went to Cape Town and this was just a, for some, some rest and relaxation, got to the hotel and the concierge said, uh, please do not take a shower unless you absolutely have to. Interesting enough, Cape Town, like many other cities, um, are now beginning to see that their water table is running dry. And so they were taking drastic effects to save the amount of water that they had left. In addition to these mega trends, the demographic shifts, we also have burnout, employee engagement. In today's workforce, 16% of people are actively disengaged from the workforce. And in fact, we're at an all-time high of employee engagement, which is only 31%. And so now when we come to the realities of working from home, our kids who are oftentimes in virtual school, mom and dad not having an easy turnoff of when does work end and when does it start. We are living through a traumatizing time. And oftentimes we've lost perspective. We've lost what it means to lead. And we oftentimes don't have a, pro have a process to help us through that. There's additional disruptive forces for many nonprofits and churches and even businesses. Um, this purposeful experimentation demand on nonprofits and yet there's a force to integrate science and to have evidence-based practices. We're seeing that large organizations uh, are beginning to be more and more dominant, but people themselves probably are less interested in the organization or the business itself and more interested in the cause. And so what does that mean for us? We're living in an information liberation, not only for us in the workplace, but also for our children with everything at their fingertips. And so when we look at all of these things that are affecting us, if you are feeling overwhelmed, uh, which I would place myself in that category, we tend to be challenged in how to sort through all of this information, all of these things happening, and how to lead with integrity. And so I'd like to introduce this process, call it the transformative or transformational process. Again, this idea of what is forming you? We're all being formed, but what is forming us and what are we being formed 
in two. And so for many of us, the majorities of our days are spent doing something or acting. Although we're learning that busyness uh, or doing activity doesn't necessarily mean learning. It doesn't necessarily mean growth. And so far too often do we take the time to reflect on our experiences and our beliefs. The things that are actually underneath our action, underneath uh, the results that we see in life are those experiences and beliefs. And so how do we begin to reflect on those experiences and then choose greatness and prioritize over just the good things? I call this moving towards our intentional or towards our transformational future. The reality of needing a process to take a step off of what sometimes feels like the rat race, where we're just going through the motions or uh, we're kind of on the hamster wheel, moving and moving, but far too often on autopilot. Especially for me, I know that oftentimes even with my children, it's like, hey, dad, where are you? Because uh, I'm thinking about all of the things that I have going in my life. And that's not intentional. That's not in purpose. So I want you to take a look at this, this process and begin reflecting on, again, those questions of what dream for your community, for your family, is beginning to emerge for you. What new perspectives can you have? The reality is, is that we can only act within the world we see. I love this quote by Stanley Howard Ross because is there three or is there four sticks, right? And in so many ways, it depends on where you stand. And so in this extremely rivalistic and divisive world that we live in, we end up standing on one side and yelling to the other, trying to convince them that our way of saying is right. And that perspective has really gotten us nowhere the divisive politics, the challenges that we have in urban communities are going to continue to be magnified. Part of being a transformational leader is to recognize your own limited capacity and your own limited perspective. To say that in community, great things can happen. New perspectives, new ways of seeing and being and acting in the world are in fact possible. So I would beg to say that for any real leadership development to happen, self-knowledge becomes a prerequisite. Taking the time to reflect, to be present with your own self, to recognize what I say, uh, your own flaws, your own challenges become the beginning of you healing your families, healing your communities. I'll say that maybe a little different way. I like to use this quote, what does it mean to love our city or love our company or love our family into greatness? This loving something into greatness is because people, just like things, over time begin to bear the mark of those who love it. See, that's that two-way process of love is that people and places over time begin to bear the mark of those who love it. But love is not just a one way, me seeing something and wanting to fix it, per se, me seeing something and wanting to just partake in what it gives me. It's, it's loving something in spite of its flaws, it's seeing the brokenness in something and loving it in spite of it this broken world, but also recognizing your own flaws and being willing to allow others to love you because of it. So I want to offer two kind of quotes to help us define transformational leadership. And then I want to just make it practical before we get more into the question and answer. So I love this definition by Robert Terry. He says that leadership is the courage to call forth authentic action in the comments. And in the comments, he doesn't mean necessarily those common pheasants, those folks over there, but it's just the public square, right? So leadership is the courage to call forth authentic action in the public square. 
And there's two main things about that that I really love about this quote. One is that uh, it's individual and it's communal, right? It's both my own courage or what I love to say, Brene Brown's quote of kind of, there's never good leadership. There's never courage unless there is also fear or anxiety close by. So leadership requires courage. It requires vulnerability to then call forth authentic action in the community for the public good. The calling forth part of love is, is, is that it's already latent. There's one of my mentors used to always say that the Holy Spirit precedes us in all things. And so we're calling forth as leaders and our family and our employees and our community, what is already there. So it's an asset based approach saying what is present in our family, what is present in our business, what is present in our church and courageously calling forth that to a bigger vision. The second quote is that leadership is a primary way in which, in which God makes us over and to his image and likeness. Now think about that. Maybe instead of leadership, you could use responsibility or authority, but that's what leadership is. Those things that you have influence, authority over, responsibility for, that leadership responsibility is a way in which God makes us over into his image and likeness. And that's because it takes increasing levels of vulnerability and risk-taking. Again, back to this idea of love and transformational leadership being a two-way process is that in order to continue to lead our family in a time like this, it requires an increasing level of vulnerability and humility. And I'll talk about that in a second. Second is it requires increasing levels of integrity. Is that leadership in a time like this is not something that you can kind of make up as you go. It does require a certain set of rhythms a certain set of uh, understanding your own personhood and humanity, both its positives and its challenges. And so how do we make this, um, I think, increasingly on the ground? Uh, what does it mean for us in the day-to-day? -day? Uh, uh, John Cotter has a, his, his book, uh, Eight Steps of Change. Uh, and I'm only going to talk primarily about one of these, but here's the eight that I think are really, really important for us during this conversation. Uh, so he goes through these eight steps and he's really the guru of change management. He says, first is that we have to establish a sense of urgency. Okay, when thinking about leadership during a time of crisis, uh, <laughs> there has to be a sense of we gotta do something uh, right now. And in many ways, I think for all of us, we are aware of that. We're aware of that sense of urgency. Uh, it's all around us, things are changing. Uh, two is the importance of building a guiding team. Uh, who are those around you that God has placed? Uh, three, we're going to talk about, uh, because I think it's really, really important around this idea of the transformative perspective. Uh, then communicating that vision and getting others to buy in, whoever those, all, those are around you. Empowering others to act on this vision, right? Uh, you as the leader probably uh, removing as many barriers as possible. Then generating short-term wins. Uh, helping people to see that it is actually important and effective, uh, consolidating those and then uh, making it stick. So the main one I think for today, but I want you to see the, bitter, the bigger picture of um, steps to change is really developing a vision for change. And again, this idea of when does burnout happen? Uh, when, when is the church... Uh, really in a position to step up and uh, be that prophetic voice is oftentimes uh, when there's a crisis. And so I think now is the time to be talking about what is, I think that as Christians, we're supposed to always have an optimistic vision for the future. In the midst of what feels like chaos, how do we develop a powerful picture, a powerful vision of what the future could be, even though there's lots to complain about. Think about that. Have you ever thought about what your kind of life vision statement is? 
we obviously have mission statements and vision statements for our organizations or churches, but what about for your own life? What about for your own family? And have you pulled that back out during this time of crisis to keep us grounded, to give us a new perspective or refresh perspective, and then communicate that with others of what is it that we actually want? I love the story of Jesus I was walking with his disciples and he sees the blind man who's uh, probably been screaming many a times as Jesus and the disciples have walked by. And this one time Jesus decides to stop by and he asks the blind man, what is it that you want? I'm pretty sure that Jesus and the disciples knew what the blind man was struggling with. But it was important for him to articulate his vision. And he said, I want to see. I think that's true for us in the midst of all of the things that hold us captive to a pessimistic vision of the future. That one that says, oh, the world is ending and maybe we should just give up. Um, As a leader, we're supposed to call forth authentic action. We're supposed to have a vision that then invites other people into it. How does it clarify that direction of your family or organization? Uh, and why it needs to move, and how does it how is it clear and compelling? So uh, I'll just share a couple examples. For myself, a few years ago, I came up with my, my own kind of life vision statement, uh, which is to courageously facilitate transformative relationships. And the vision is never really accomplished. I never am done courageously facilitating relationships. There's always more work to, to do. But it is clear, and I use that as a barometer to some extent to say, do I wanna participate in this thing or that thing? And I have to filter it through that lens. And so we've been doing that over the holiday season with our own family. It's trying to give my my children, I have an eight-year-old, a five-year-old and a two-year-old, trying to give them some optimistic vision, even though for my son, soccer has been, uh, soccer practice has been canceled. Uh, School has been canceled in many ways. Thanksgiving, in the way that we typically celebrate it, was not celebrated. And he's feeling this sense of frustration as he, in his own way, is experiencing trauma. And so my wife and I have been really trying to articulate, what what is the vision we have for our family? And how do we call our young children into that large, compelling vision? And so we've been talking a lot about uh, uh, laughter and listening and being innovative and helping instill in our children, that's who we are. And so instead of calling them out when they act up, it's calling them in and saying, hey, uh, that's not who we are as a family. We're more than that. We're more than that. And trying to create that vision for them. So as, before we move into the kind of q and I just wanted to do some of my own kind of, as I've been doing, reflection on, uh, so how do we lead during this uh, season of, you know, just total unrest and, um, and what does that look like? And so um, a couple, couple points I want to just take away uh, to leave you with. Sometimes leaders talk and they shouldn't. And the best thing to do is just listen. And I say that from uh, falling into that trap of, uh, for myself, uh, my father is African-American and my mom is white. And so, you know, after the riots in Grand Rapids, uh, I got just a ton of phone calls and text messages of people saying, hey, you know, as someone who cares about race and cares about our city, you know, what do you think? Should you say something? Can you do a podcast? Can you? Um, and I just think that there was a there was a period of time in which it was best to just be present in the moment. To absorb some of the realities of what were going on, to try to think through where was Jesus in all of this and what my call was before trying to jump in to to share something. And so in many ways, this is one of the few times that I've tried to emerge from that longer period of reflection uh, to say something, because I think leadership oftentimes, especially during times of crisis, can start with listening. (laughs) Number two, uh, we are living in the apocalypse, uh, or the apocalypsis is the Greek word. which is uh, really just a time of revealing, time of unveiling of what is working and what is essential and in many ways who survives and who doesn't. Unfortunately, in the 
business community out of this crisis, there are winners and there are losers. There are people who are surviving and people who are not during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so what does that mean for you in terms of your leadership? What is it forming you to? Uh, number three, rhythms, relationships, and righteousness cannot be created or manipulated in times of crisis, but rather they are built before you, before you need them. So let me start with rhythms. Rhythms uh, are this idea that for me, I've been instituting for probably the past five years, uh, a rhythm of reflection, a rhythm of discernment, a rhythm of action. Uh, a couple things that means. One is one day alone um, by myself outside of my home or outside of my office in which I can be present with myself or with God. Um, oftentimes that is half a day kind of being quiet and half a day of strategic planning. Um, other times it's journaling, it's going to the beach. It's putting in some form of rhythm that allows me to process what the heck is just happening. And what does that mean for me and how should I behave? And to try to think that you're going to institute something like that immediately when there's a crisis is probably not true. It's the same thing as exercise or dieting is that uh, it's really hard to say, hey, I'm going to start dieting here during the holiday season. You have to have a better rhythm that you've already created before that thing hits. Second is relationships. One of the organizations that I'm a part of or collaboratives is called the Grand Rapids Center for Community Transformation. And we have a historically white global organization in partnership with um, a primarily African-American uh, historical institution. And we are co-located in the same place. We've been doing this for approximately six years, building relationships between the two groups, between the staff, between the organizations. Um, and in many ways, we see the value now of these relationships uh, during the past year and how now we've created a platform for real dialogue. We've had to have a monthly meeting in which we're able to process these things in relationship um, of what's happening in our world and what it means for us. How does it help us lead? What are we learning? And finally, three, righteousness cannot be created or manipulated in times of crisis. Righteousness is this idea. The Hebrew word is the sarik, or the sarakim. This was the just one, the one who has power, the one who has privilege and influence, and says, I'm willing to willingly give those things up, not government mandated, but because of my own soul work. I'm willing to give things up for the sake of others, for the sake of righteousness. And to think that all of a sudden now in a time of crisis, uh, that that's necessarily going to compel you uh, may not be true. But rather, how do you create righteousness? How do you create rhythms of righteousness uh, for times of crisis? What does that look like for you? And finally, I'll end with kind of seven characteristics that I think are the future of leadership uh, for us to be thinking about how are we instilling these things in our own time. One is uh, just humility. Uh, we see that uh, to lead during this time takes multiple people in multiple sectors um, that we don't know all the answers. We're solving multiple problems uh, that we don't even necessarily know exactly what the question is. Um, and so that does require humility. Number two, again, collaborative, multi-sector and global. How do we think about the global issues at hand, but also what are the local solutions? Uh, I think there's this idea of uh, embracing diversity of all kinds. And I don't mean uh, per se accepting or agreeing with or um, I don't know, I, I, but it's the idea that uh, diversity is here um, of all different kinds. And what does it mean for you to recognize that it's here to stay? How do you lead in a way? that embraces the reality of the current situation and then sees God in it. Four, we've talked about this willingness to take greater risk and cut through the noise. Um, here's a great new Netflix film called uh, uh, The Social Dilemma that just talks about the echo chambers that we live in. There is so much noise and to cut through 
some of the political noise, to cut through some of the uh, agenda noise, um, and still speak truth uh, is going to be increasingly required uh, in today's world. Five, how are we cognizant of our own rivalry and scapegoating? So in the middle of all of this diversity, all of these different perspectives, how are we cognizant of our desire to want to blame others? So I would say, what's the rivalry that wars within you? What is the rivalry that wars within you that wants to then scapegoat the other? Leaders have to be cognizant of what it is that is always stirring up inside of them. Uh, six uh, has been a key point. Uh, have a compelling and optimistic vision and express that. As you articulate that, how do we express that vision to our families, to our communities, um, that again, the Holy Spirit is doing something and we get to join in. Seven is uh, leaders have to be able to manage rapid change, uh, that it's coming increasingly fast, or as I think uh, Google CEO said a few months ago, we accomplished in four months what we couldn't accomplish in 10 years is that the internet is now necessary for daily life. Um, what does that rapid pace of change mean for us? And what's the rhythm, the relationships, and righteousness that we want to strive for uh, as we think about uh, the future that we want for our children and our children's children? So I'll go back uh, as we end and move to the Q&A um, of the two questions that I started with uh, that hopefully now uh, we can have a discussion on is uh, what dream for your community or family is emerging for you in light of all of these changes as you take a chance to kind of sit back and reflect what is the optimistic dream that you have for your family uh, in the midst of this formative or transformative time and then number two is is there a new lens that's been transforming your perspective in the midst of all the many voices have you taken some time to reflect and discern and say, how has those things influenced my beliefs or my actions? What new perspective is emerging? So excited to get to the Q&A. Uh, hope you enjoy the content and uh, look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Justin, for uh, introducing us to this idea of transformational leadership. Um, for those of you who haven't asked a question or would like to ask a question, if you're watching on Facebook, you may enter questions there or go to or send it a, a question to digital at acton.org. And we'd be happy to ask your questions live with Justin. So Justin, as I was listening and, and pondering what you were talking about, um, leadership comes in many forms. And, and usually when you go to a, a bookstore, or, or you hear leadership in, in popular culture, it's usually directed at, at the business leader or, or the political leader, but you really brought it down to, um, it, it includes and encompasses those, but also there's a real familial and even personal aspect to it. Um, and and your, your PhD and your, your doctorate and your research are in transformational leadership. Can, can you tell me a little bit about what, um, what that means, what, what is transformational leadership ultimately trying to differentiate itself from just kind of just regular leadership? What, what's the crux uh, of the idea? Yeah, it's a great question, Dan. Uh, I love it. And, you know, it is, a, it is like a catchy word now, transformational. And, uh, it's, it's kind of, in many ways, become a buzzword. Um, but for me, the way I look at uh, transformational leadership is really being not a not a destination uh but but transformation being a process right and that that process is formative and it first and foremost is is i would say individual uh it's the it's the deep soul worker is my kind of uh, early formative years uh, were formed in social work and there's this idea of you can only take someone else as far as you have gone yourself right? In a, in a therapeutic relationship, per se. And so I think the same now is trying to transfer that idea of 
uh, into business, into family, right? Is that you can only lead someone as far as you've been willing to go. And so there's this great quote that I often use by um, Franciscan priest Richard Gore. It just talks about, you know, uh, we, we transmit the wounds that we don't transform. And it's this idea that we've all been deeply wounded and we have a tendency then to mask those wounds and transmit them into our businesses, our organizations, our families, um, right? It's, it's hurt people, hurt people. Uh, hurt organizations, hurt uh, people who work there for them. Uh, and acknowledging all of that and the realities of that, working through them to find healing in them, and then leading from that deep place of vulnerability, which takes uh, higher levels of courage. So it's a process versus a destination. It's inward looking versus uh, only external. Thank you. That That's good. Um... At, at Acton here, we one of our core values is thinking about what does it mean to be a human person, a- anthropology, what, what does it mean to be made in the image of God, how do we interact with ourselves, with our families, and, and, and in society, and and I think you, you know, you, you study this, uh, there's a buzzword out there now, you know, dignity, or the, this, this concept of, you know, the, the alienation of the self from so many other institutions. And what, what do you think right now you, I mean, you, you keyed in on a lot of mega trends and then near, near the end of your, your talk, you know, you, you talk about just 2020, what a strange year. We, you have the major racial tensions. We have COVID-19 in all of its facets, economic personal, relational, psychological, you know, the, the devastation that's there. I mean, what, what, are, your, what are some real, cha- uh, what, what changes need to happen tangibly, I guess? Is there, is there one or two things that you think about um, that, that are some core changes that you think need to happen to help uh, leaders of all stripes think through this, this really strange time? Yeah. Yeah, what a great, great. Uh, question. Um, this idea too of the, the dignity of the human person. Um, and what does that mean as we think about, you know, a lot of times we talk about the, the um, you know, Jesus as, as God, but sometimes miss, you know, Jesus is, as human and, and Jesus frees us to be fully human. Um, there's an organization that a global kind of organization that I'm a part of that um, works with grassroots leaders uh, throughout um, urban cities across the globe. And we talk about these paradigm shifts that uh, we see as core to being uh, embodied within the leader and within an organization and ultimately a city for in many ways, the healing of cities. And I think, now more than ever, those ring true. One of them is this idea of how do we move from this ideology of scarcity to one of abundance? Hmm. Um, and so we see this now, right? Uh, it's, it's always been there. And it doesn't matter if you're materially rich or poor, uh, you can have a scarcity mentality um, that is thinking about a zero sum game and how do I get more for myself versus uh, understanding that we have to start from the place of, of God's yes. God's place of abundance. So I would say that, that's one major shift is uh, how do we not think about what is mine when it comes to partnerships, relationships, the way that I would say, um, you know, real change happens at the pace of deep, deep relationships. That requires an abundance mentality. The second one is, uh, and I mentioned it, is this idea of moving from away from rivalry to one of peacemaking. And rivalry is... Um, has been there for years. It's the way our societies operate is that when there becomes tension, we, we, we are, uh, we need to find a scapegoat. We need someone to blame Jesus becoming the ultimate, uh, to really reveal to us our own rivalry. And so a lot of times I ask the question and in order to move through that process ourselves, we have to ask ourselves, what is the rivalry that is warring within ourselves? What are we defending and why? And are we defending it at what cost versus peacemaking is, is, is different than peacekeeping. It doesn't mean that we're not addressing difficult issues, um, but it is understanding that the goal is uh, shalom. Uh, and then the third one I would say is this idea of kind of 
theory from above to incarnational uh, practice, one that moves uh, not just from the ivory towers, but has uh, a real depth of um, local presence, uh, one that is not just programs, but that one is uh, present with people. Uh, and I would say specifically has an understanding of those people who are on the margins. What does that look like as we uh, act and move uh, in our day to day? Thank you for that. Our um, we, we have a question from the audience. From th This one comes from Phil, and, and I think it relates to what you're talking about. Um, you, you talked about, you know, your personal or family vision statement that not, you know, not only an organization needs a, a, a mission statement, but also families and people can develop that. He asks, uh, what exercises or tools can you recommend to help sub someone articulate their vision? Are there, are there books or tools that you can help people uh, help show, point people towards? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I don't know if um, we've necessarily, you know, read any particular books. Although there is one that I've kind of just started called "The Other Half of the Church," uh, and it is beginning to address uh, even the concept of joy uh, and the way that uh, laughter uh, works. And I think I shared that as being one of our. Uh, kind of values is, is uh, laughter. During this kind of traumatizing time, uh, laughter becomes a really big healing uh, mechanism. I don't necessarily think that there's a right way to do this. Um, you know, in general, I would say vision statements, you want them to be uh, something that can easily be memorized, something that's, you know, five to seven words uh, and something that's compelling. Um, a, a exercise I've used through, you know, just consulting with organizations more so than with families is just taking sticky notes and allowing people to write the words, depending if it's age appropriate for uh, you to do this. Just write words that kind of embody your values. And then you can do this exercise called voting with your feet, where you give each person a, you put all of those, right, write as many as you can on sticky notes, put them on a, a whiteboard somewhere. Each person then gets three dot stickers that they have to vote on the words that seem to mean uh, the most to your family. And you begin to whittle that down and then you can choose one. But I think, uh, I think more importantly, it's the process of engaging your family in an intentional way that begins to, to, to really help us live into a larger identity during uh, this season is, is just really important. And don't you really think that that, I mean, you, you talked about this action, discernment, reflection, uh, rotation. I mean, the discernment and reflection piece, while endemically human, is really hard to do. The modern world seems to take uh, uh, the, the speed at which we are are going. It really makes those ideas hard. Would, would you agree or, or disagree with that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the the... The research is saying just by email volume uh, that every year our email volume increases by 30%. Yeah. And, you know, most people don't have a strategy for how you're going to even deal with that increase of email. Um, right. And I think the same is true for, for families for uh, reflecting. We have information just overload and it's kind of this like, how do we filter all of that? How do we make sense of all of it? How do we take time to have our own thoughts and be creative? Um, the only way to do it is just to do it, like the, and, and to to see the benefits um, of getting away from the noise, to be present with yourself and see what surfaces, and be a, be alone with those demons long enough that it transforms you. I mean, it's very you know it's very scary to be alone. Uh, if you haven't done it for a while, to be silent for three hours seems like the strangest thing. Um, but I have just increasingly tried to make it a habit. You know, last year I got a chance to take six weeks. I didn't think it was possible, but I took six weeks off of work. Uh, three of those days were um, in complete silence. And the, the clarity that emerged from me being in that time alone and being able to uh, face now this season uh, I credit it to that time off 
and the time and silence of really being able to hear from God and wrestle with my own uh, things. But yes, it's hard. There. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, you could even, if you think about the season, you know, Advent as, as Christians, um, man, many of our participants are, you know, believers and we're in the season of Advent and the incarnation of Christ seems to speak to this, the, the theological rhythm of, of Advent. I mean, do you, do you find uh, engagement in, in or, or thinking differently about it in, in this era of Advent than the next few weeks, thinking about what leads to Christmas? Yeah. Yeah. It's such a, um, it's such a beautiful time. And it, my fear is that for some, the, lack of normalcy will rob us from this beautiful um, period of time that we're in mm -hmm. um, where we celebrate uh, more than anything above family and presence and gathering. Uh, those are symbolic uh, in many ways, expressions of what we're celebrating, but the reality of the God man, right? The, the God with all power and privilege, or as some would say that the downward spiral of wrapping himself in flesh, or as the message says, says in John, right? He, Jesus moves into the neighborhood, this act of presence. Um, and that we, as believers, Christ in us, uh, to be present in the world. But it's really hard to be present um, in the world when we're not even present with ourselves. And I think this time is such a great reminder for us to really recognize um, what the incarnation means. I had a great friend in, in Guatemala and I, and I asked him, he kept talking about, you know, incarnation and incarnational leadership. And this was my seven, eight years. I said, what does that mean to you? He said, it means that the most important thing is to be here with you right now. That the incarnation frees us to move away from, living out of fear to, to live in freedom and to be present right here, right now, to be quiet enough in our souls um, that we recognize that the joy of the Lord is here in this moment in which we get to experience Christ and others. Uh, what, a, what a beautiful gift this season is as we anticipate uh, Christmas. Absolutely. Um I'm always intrigued. You you brought up uh, the the idea of integrity uh, several times in in your talk, and we know integrity. You know the the root is wholeness. This idea of being whole or consistent. Um, we we've seen some in both in the Christian leadership world of of nonprofits and churches. Um, it's not new, but. The last year has been there's been some colossal failures, and uh, the business world is full of uh, anecdotes as well. What do you think? I mean, have you had to deal with personally in in your own life, whether through leadership on the boards of, of organizations or, or other friends that are leaders? How do you help people transition or think through what leadership failure looks like or or why people fail? and how you work through a process. When you talk about trans, uh, transformational leadership, um, leadership is a, is a really difficult thing. You know, we all have vices and virtues. <laughs> and um, especially in times of, um, of trauma, in times of crisis, um, there is a tendency to run towards uh, your vices. Um, and we see that, right? We see that in the data. We see that in um, suicide rates and, and alcohol use and domestic violence. Um, we see that with people's, you know, financial interactions. And as people are wrestling familiar organizationally, uh, what to do with, uh, you know, the, the pandemic and crisis and I think that's the that's the point that kind of point number three is like the the rhythms, relationships and righteousness. Uh, you can't really just create all of a sudden. Um, you know, it, the, the, the game is on now. And if you haven't been practicing, then uh, it's, it's more of a challenge. Um, I do think the process of 
action, reflection, discernment, and to instill into your daily life. And for me, that also, the discernment part is in community. And that's like where the accountability comes into play, right? That's your small group. That's your church. That's your one-on-one mentorship that you have, that you're receiving, that it's not, you're not doing this in an isolated vacuum. Uh, You don't lead by yourself. Uh, That's, that's not the reality of how it works. It's surrounding yourself and being vulnerable enough prior to crises to allow people into your soul and to speak into you. Um, I think that rhythm for me is I do find myself um, when I get out of that rhythm, um, that how much I actually crave it and miss it. And when I kind of jump back into having a day alone, I recognize, Ooh, there's some stuff in there that maybe uh, I was kind of leaning towards that, that I've missed. So I think, again, the processes and developing processes and rhythms allow us to be held, to be sustained in times of crisis. Um, so it's never too late, but I think that's the, that's the reality is put those things in place. And, and uh, you know, there's lots of talk and books written about accountability and what that looks like. And it, it, it really is, uh, again, that's about relationship for me. Are you willing to be vulnerable enough with other people that you let them into the realities of your soul. And that's what leadership is really about is to go to those places that at least for many men, the the biggest fear is like to be found out that you're somehow a fraud. Right. And so people cake on layers of protection in the wall and they end up leading from a place that really is all about what they think other people want of them instead of what God has called them to be. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's an important thing and it's, um, it's real. Yeah. We, we have one more question, um, from the listening audience. Um, David is from Belize, uh, in Central America. He says, great presentation. Yeah. He's the Dean of a small liberal arts college and, uh, he wants to get connected with you. He thinks this is great. We'll, uh, we'll send on your, his email to you. Uh, but he asks, When you mention accepting diversity, are you referring to a culture of dialogue and collaboration in line with what Pope Francis expounds on in his most recent encyclical? So I I don't know if you've read that or or have engaged that at all, but uh, is it the culture of dialogue and collaboration a part of what you're thinking about? Yeah, I haven't read the encyclical. Uh, I've heard a little bit about it. Uh, and I've, I figured this conversation uh, at some point, somebody would ask that question. So I'm glad that <laughs> I'm glad that you did. Um, and, I, and I'm not even sure uh, part of it. The reason I put it in there was for the sake of dialogue. I mean, I think that is uh, where we want the conversation to go. Um, and it's probably more about the embracing of people than it is about agendas is what I would say. Um, and when I mean it, diversity is here, right? That's of, that's of people, that's of ideas, that's of politics, that's of economic and political policy. Um, it is the realities that our cities are becoming increasingly uh, diverse and mixed. And there's all of these things around. And I think the sooner we can come to grips with reality, the sooner we're going to be able to have meaningful dialogue um, about those things. It's what is the opportunity to be the incarnation in the midst of all of the stuff? Um, what does that mean? How am I at peace with myself that I'm not scapegoating others? Right. That's the that's the challenge. Is that if we're not at peace with ourselves, we scapegoat someone else. It doesn't matter who the other is. That's just the way that. Uh, the world works. But if peacemaking and shalom and flourishing of all people is the goal, then what type of conversation might we have with someone or or, um, partnership might we build, even if it is with someone that we, you know, uh, disagree with on policy or agenda. So it it is, let's say people first um, is at the heart of it. It's the, uh, oftentimes it's the motivation behind that. And so as a transformative leader, I think it is increasingly important 
to set tables that um, you're able to be principled yet adaptive um, to understand your principles, but also have relationships that allow you to hear other people uh, as well. And that's what we want, right? That's what Acton is about, is having diverse dialogue and bringing in voices and having the conversations, um, even if there's not complete alignment, that's okay. Letting that be increasingly the norm. Absolutely. It's, uh, I think we, we, we want to focus on what are the right questions to be asking, not necessarily the right answers. And I, and I think that can be a, a buzzword, a buzz phrase at times, but uh, what you, you mentioned mega trends in, in your talk is there one or two that you think is most impactful um, in, in maybe the Grand Rapids context or, or even the American context? Do, do you see one or two trends that um, is most cutting edge or, or will have the most uh, strongest effect in, in the next five to 10 years, if we can take that time frame? Is there one of those mega trends that you think is that, that your eye is on or, or you're interested in? I, I mean, I think the automation of things in 5G, I mean, it's all, it's like that was a 10-year projection of 30% of the global workforce being right. displaced. I think that's already happened and happening, right? It's sped up. It's not a 10-year projection anymore. It's like in the next three years, that is the reality as 5G rolls out all across and allows for, um, you know, automated cars and working from home and, and now... Uh, in terms of COVID and safety and social distancing, that has been ramped up. And I, and I think we, have, we already see it is that the effects of this is that they do disproportionately affect those who are already poor and vulnerable. Right. Um, and so in many ways for, for those, you know, like me, who I can work from home, I can do Zooms, I can do lots of stuff from my house and with my computer, um, that's not the case uh, for the reality of, 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 you know, billions of people. And so I, I think that's both local and global is what does that look like? And in many ways, it's still hidden, uh, at least in Grand Rapids in the U.S., where it's you see there is some pain and there is some suffering, um, but it's been propped up by, you know, stimulus packages and um, philanthropy you know, as people have responded to the crisis as it's a, it's a disaster. And so we're doing stuff. There's food and clothes and, you know, dollars for the businesses. What happens long term as those things uh, and those businesses close down permanently, I think, are a much bigger challenge that uh, I am concerned about. That's good. I, I was talking with an economic historian uh, from Oxford recently and uh, he wrote a great little book called The uh, Technology Trap, and it is fantastic. But what one thing he mentioned is when we talk about short-term and long-term, what we forget is short-term in industrial revolution, in the different industrial revolutions, was anywhere from two to three generations. Yeah. So short-term isn't two years. Yeah. Short-term is 20 to 70 years. Yeah. And what, what do we do with those vulnerable populations? Um, great. Great insights. Well, Justin, what, what a pleasure to have you. Thank you for the work you do here in Grand Rapids and the impact beyond the city itself. Thank you for spending your time and your expertise to develop uh, and talk with us about this. For those of you who have participated, thank you so much for your engagement, your questions. Uh, in the near future, we will be publishing the Act and Lecture Series list for 2021. So be on the outlook, uh, lookout for that. And please enjoy the season as best you can with your family in the strangeness. And like uh, Justin said, laugh a little. Try to find the areas of hope and enjoyment with those who are around you. And on behalf of the Acton Institute, our executives and the staff that work hard uh, to, to bring these ideas to you, thank you very much. And we hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you.